I'm going to talk about Lorenzo Langstroth because he, in some quarters, he gets a lot of praise and in other quarters, perhaps a lot less. We're going to talk about the time he lived in and his life and his contribution. And I suppose there's two big questions. Firstly, how important was his movable frame beehive? And the second question then is how much credit should he get for it? Because um, there are different views onto that. So I think we'll start by looking at the world into which Langstroth came. We've been keeping bees. We humans have been keeping bees or been loosely landlords of bees for at least 2,000 years. Dr. Ava Crane, in her wonderful book, um, The World History of Beekeeping and Honey Hunting, um, which is a fantastic book if, um, if you have birthdays coming up. It's expensive, but it's lovely. Um, talks about the beekeeping in ancient Egypt in clay pots. But ever since you know bees like to go into a, a nice, nice sized and nice shaped cavity. And ever since we've been cooking food, which is a lot longer than 2,000 years, we've been storing food um, in clay pots and baskets and wicker baskets. And um, bees like to take up residence in clay pots and wicker baskets. So maybe the first beekeepers were accidental. But certainly we've been keeping bees for a long, long time. But for a long, long time, for most of that time, we've been keeping bees in straw skeps in a very simple way, not really actively managing bees. And now, of course, we've got the movable frame beehive where we're actually able to get in and properly manage our bees. So let's have a look at that history up until uh, Langstroth. Um, there have been attempts in the past to have movable bar hives. In fact, there's this chap called Wheeler, who, Englishman, who went on a tour of Europe in the 1680s. In 1682, he was in Greece, and he came across a top bar hive in a skep. And, um, sorry, that's Langstroth, and that's his hive. I'll have a quick look at that. We'll have a talk, that, talk about that later. Um, so we're going to look at, we're going to look at his, um, we're going to look at, at uh, Wheeler's hive first. This is, this is the illustration of the top bar hive, of the top, yes, the top bar hive. As you can see, it's in a saucer and it's on a stand and these little, little bees flying around the place. And you can read this book, it's, uh, it, it, it is available. What he says was, and I copied this in here, I was conducted into a garden furnished with four or five hundred stocks of bees. So quite a lot of bees. You know, I mean, that's, that's quite some management. Um, now, of course, you know, in the old days, people used to exaggerate lots of things. The tops are covered with broad, flat sticks. Now, I don't think these come into the category of broad. I think the person who drew this just got a, you know, here's a, here's a few quid. Draw me some pictures for my new book, would you? Um, and whoever drew it didn't necessarily understand what they were, didn't, didn't necessarily see it. The tops are covered in broad, flat sticks, along each of which the bees fasten their combs so that a comb may be taken out whole with the greatest ease imagine, imaginable. And if you're running four or five hundred stocks of bees, you probably need that level of, um, uh, that, you, you probably need to have movable frame hives, otherwise, it, you know, if you can be doing any, or movable bar hives. So over the next period, there were various attempts to improve from skep beekeeping. Um, and actually, the Schilling Bee Book, published in 1847 in the UK, says, I'm going to read this to you. Perhaps the most effective and generally useful hive, both for the scientific and the practical apiarian, is the Grecian hive. And, it, and this is it. Um, with a bar as foundation to each individual comb. And then it, go, it goes on to say that the bar should be this width and so on and so forth. So up until, from the 1600s and before, there, until the 1850s, there were very, as Dr. Crane calls it, rational improvements in hives. However, beekeeping was really fragmented. You know, we all try new stuff on beekeeping, don't we? And back then, there was much less of a, there weren't these national associations, there, wasn't a, there weren't standards, there weren't big manufacturers making stuff. So, so you'd read books or you'd try stuff. Um, and so the sort of thing that we've seen is a lot of skep beekeeping, rural farmers skep bee beekeeping. And then you see things like this. This is, the, this is the, the nut hive, right, as you can see, 1832. And it's like a drinks cabinet, isn't it? It's like an old-fashioned sideboard or something. I mean, and you've got your bees in different places. And this is a glass globe here. 
and the bees come up into the glass globe and, and make, you know, put comb and um, honey in the comb. And I don't know what these drawers are for. I have no idea. I mean, can you imagine? Can you try to manage bees in that? Um, but this is, these were the attempts. People had some flawed understanding of what was going on, and they were trying to find some way to make beehives that made sense. And there were lots of books written. But most people kept their bees in straw skeps. Now, because skeps, skep beekeeping is easy. It's great, of course, isn't it? Because you can spend your summer watching cricket. You don't have to worry about, you know, inspecting your bees. Because you can't. You can't get in there. You can't, you can't look into the hive. There's very little you can do. All you do, really, is you, get, you catch a swarm in a, in a, in a, in a basket, a skep, um, and you... Um, put it on a flat board, you put a hackle, that's a, a, like a straw um, roof on top, thatched roof on top, and that's it, and you can ignore it. There's no inspections because you can't see anything. At the end of the summer, you lift them up, and you see which is the heaviest one, and the heaviest one, typically, you kill the bees and take the honey. Or maybe there are some techniques for not killing all the bees, but it's very, very disruptive for the bees. Um, disease control, there isn't any. You just wait for them to die. Swarm control, you just make some more skeps and leave them out. I hope the bees get them, because you can't control swarming, because there's nothing you can do at all. So the advantages are it's really low tech. You don't have to be able to read and write. You don't have to have carpentry skills or carpentry tools. You don't really have to have very much at all that can't be taught from one illiterate farmer to another. And it's, it's very inexpensive. You can make a skep with what you have at home. Um, and you can, and the bees can, once the bees arrive in it, you can carry on doing your beekeeping. You don't, and remember that the honey is for your own use probably anyway, so you're just taking the comb out and eating the comb. Um, it's fantastically simple and great for subsistence farming, subsistence beekeepers. Of course, the disadvantages are there's no disease control, there's no swarm control, there's no reusing comb. And what you're, from a Darwinian, from a selection of the species point of view, what you're doing is you're selecting for low yielding, because you're killing the high yielding ones, yes? You're selecting for low yielding, high swarming bees, which, <laughs> which is probably because they've been doing that, skep beekeeping so long, it may be why we get so much more swarming now. Maybe if you went back 10,000 years, you would have a lot less swarming. Who knows? We're not able to find out. Of course, there's no role for the British Beekeeping Association because there's nothing they can teach you. There's nothing that's worth learning because that's it. That's all beekeeping is, you know. It's a bit like, you know, plant and spuds, stick them in the ground, wait till they grow, ground, job done. But it only brings you maybe about 20 pound of honey a skep. And that, you might get different views on that, but so on. So let's bring you to the... 1800s. You've got the US Civil War going on. You've got the Industrial Revolution in this country and in the US going on full swing. You've got the first telegraph about, about 1850, 1850, 1850, I think, between international, between uh, Dover and uh, Cap Grenet in France. You had, you had cholera ec epidemics in London. John Snow hadn't worked out at that stage, or was just working out at that stage, that cholera wasn't created by miasma, it was created by um, waterborne infections and managing to prove that. Railway spreading and that sort of thing. Mass production, you started to seeing stuff being made in factories, precision made stuff in factories. And so that's, that's, that brings us up to the 1850s, which is when Langstroth gave us, this is when Langstroth started to give us his invention. So now let's go back and look at Langstroth himself. Um, he was, his grandfather, was from, any Yorkshire people here today? From Langstrothdale, naturally enough. Anybody here from Langstrothdale? <laughs> no. Um, uh, he came to Phil went to Philadelphia from Langstrothdale, went on business and stayed. Um, married a, married a Anne Uke from Prussia. His son John married Rebecca Dunn um, from a rich family. And she had Huguenot um, associations and produced Lorenzo Lorraine, and Lorraine being a maternal, maternal grandparent name, Langstroth. He was born on Christmas Day, uh, 1810. And from an early age, he was fascinated by insects, all sorts of insects. But he was a bright boy, and he went to Yale College, and Yale was a big deal even then, back when he was 17. Um, and he studied well, and he did well in school, in college. There was, it was a religious revival, and he got very involved with that. A number of religious revivals over the 18th century, as we saw in Methodism in Wales and so on. Um, um, but in the 1850s, there was one around, around those parts, and Langstroth got involved with that and became quite religious. 
Um, he'd also promised his parents that he would obey all the school rules. And in um, the 1830s, there was a... Uh, 1820s, the bread and butter rebellion in Yale College where the students said, this food's disgusting, we're not eating this rubbish, and they went on strike. And they said, we're not eating in the, in the dining hall. Um, Langstroth, of course, had promised his parents that he would obey, obey the rules. So Langstroth, on his own and nobody else, went into the dining hall and had his dinner. Which tells you something about him being, you could call that strength of character, or you could call that being bloody stupid. But uh, either way, you can see he was quite a singular you know, quite a singular creature, we'll say that. He graduated in 31, 1831, and got a job as a tutor, and he went back to Yale as a tutor in Yale, and he became a minister as well. Um, but in, in, in 1836, of the South Church in Andover, Massachusetts, which apparently is still there today. So if you're in that part of the world, do go and have a look at it. Um, got married in 1836. Uh, he'd suffered throughout his life, throughout his career, his adult life, from what we would now call depression. Um, at least, you know, it, obviously it hasn't, we can't diagnose from 200 years ago, but it, it has a lot of the symptoms of what we associate with depression today, a nervous malady. And he had to give up work. Um, and he struggled with that all his life. Um, now, I want to read you this here. So, 1838, he, he had to give up his ministry. Um, and he went to see a friend of his, um, and he went to see this, this, this friend of his uh, chatting away and, and, oh, across his desk. And his friend had one of these things, this thing here, on his desk. Oh, and and Langstroth said, well, what's that? I said, oh, that's, a, that's, that's bees. Do you want to have a look at my bees? And he had bees in his attic. So he goes upstairs to, to his attic, to the guy's attic. And I'm going to read this to you. R Langst Langstroth reports that the experience seemed like a, bent, uh, like a pent up fire to burst in flame. Before I went home, I bought two stocks of bees in common box hives, and thus my apiarian career began. Anybody else have that experience where you see bees, somebody else, and you go, oh, I want to get into this? You know, it's, sometimes it's like that, isn't it, with bees? It's like, God, this is cool. Um, in terms of his career, he took another teaching job and struggled with that and had to give that up and became a pastor again, and he resigned again. Beekeeping wise, he tried various things. He tried log hives, which is a hollowed out log. He tried Huber leaf hives. I'll show you the Huber hive, actually. Huber was an interesting guy, blind, went blind in his early adulthood, Swiss. Um, and, uh, but he had a servant who could see happily. And with his servant, this is a Huber hive, it's a leaves, and they are held together with leather at the one, one side. And as you can see, it's an attempt to have, if not movable, separatable frames of some sort, but difficult to work but starting to get the idea, perhaps, but still not really figuring out how it's working. Um, so he tried, he tried various, uh, yeah, he tried various different hives. Uh, he said, the, the use of the Huber hive had satisfied me that with proper precautions, the combs might be removed without enraging the bees, and that these insects were capable of being tamed to a surprising degree. Without knowledge of these facts, I should never have regarded a hive permitting the removal of the combs as uh, I, should have, I should have regarded it as being quite too, quite too dangerous. As you can imagine, you know, it's a, quite a change. If you've, ever, if you've kept bees in skeps, you'll know, you know, it's, and you try to get in there and get at the bees. He had Huber's book. Huber wrote a book. So these books were being written, and Huber obviously didn't write in English. He wrote in French, I think. German, French, I think. Um, and, had, and translated it, and it was translated into English. He had Huber's book which is this one uh, in English. And he had Bevan's book as well. Bevan was, I believe, a Welsh guy in London who wrote. And Bevan uh, created a hive as well. And I think he tried the Bevan hive as well. And this is the Bevan hive here. And they have little doors on the front, as you can see. It's starting to look like a... Like a now, these are top bars, not frames. But it's starting to look. It's a box, at least. So they're trying to get it. Now, the, 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 the cover, what we would call the crown board, rested on top of the frames, on top of the top bars, directly on top. And um, again, I'm gonna, he, he discovered, I say he discovered, and that's kind of the, the, the big question, I suppose. Did he discover it? Did he read it somewhere else? That a space about the B space, three-eighths of an inch, quarter of an inch, something like that, between the bars, between the top bars and the what we'll call crown board, doesn't get properized on built-in. So he started using that, and he applied for, he started to decide to apply for a patent for it. And then, 
he's coming home from his apiary in Oct on October the 30th, which I think is Wednesday, isn't it? Next Wednesday? October the 30th, 1851. I'm going to read this to you. He was coming home from his apiary, uh, pondering, the, this is out of Florence Nail's book, um, which I'll give you the reference of later. The, pondering the annoying necessity of having to cut down the sides, because the top bars, you can move the bars, but you have to cut the, because the, the comb attaches to the walls each time. And then he had the idea, if you could put uprights in the bars, then you could, um, with the same gap as he's used at the roof, uh, or the crown board, then he could do something. So he had this great idea, and he wrote it down. Here's his notes, October the 30th, 1851. And as you can see, this is the, uh, what we would now call the top bar, and these are the sides. And he's put, drawn another one in here for strength or something. And in this one, he's drawn the floor, and he's written cheap hive. So this is his idea. This is in his notebook. Um, so he had this great idea, and he said, damn, this is it. So he, patent, so he tried it, and he patented it in 1852. I'll show you the patent, actually. This is the patent, you know, cheap hive. It doesn't, well, I suppose compared to Nutt's drinks cabinet, this is cheap, but it's still a lot more expensive than a skep. Um, and he's got little floors and a little, little door here and, a, you know, lots of fiddly, finicky bits that you, if you were making it yourself, you probably wouldn't be doing that. You wouldn't, you wouldn't make all these bits, would you, if you're making it yourself? He, he, he sold the rights in the Western Territories of the USA to a Mr. Otis, of course, who became a big name in beekeeping, um, and so made some money from that. And Otis was manufacturing it. He published a book in 1853. So there you go. This is his original book, and this is the... But it's still in print. In fact, you, it, and the original is, is available online, some of the bits I'm quoting from. And all this by the age of 50, 43... Samuel Wagner, who's a pal of uh, Langstroth, created the American Bee Journal in 1861. So now there's, now there's a way to communicate it, and, and, and there's something to communicate as well. There's something worth telling beekeepers about, because if this works, it changes beekeeping. Um, you may have heard of things called patent trolls, which are a scourge of the, um, of, of, of the tech industry, um, in the, particularly in the States, but also here, where, people, where you, you patent something, which you invented, and then somebody comes, else comes along, somebody with deep pockets, and says, I invented that, and I, that's my patent, you're infringing on my patent, and then you've got to go to court, and it takes years, and it costs you an awful lot of money to, to, to prove that they have no rights, and you end up spending all your money, and it happens today, and it happened in the 1850s, and one of these guys had a go at Langstroth, with, apparently without merit, without, without having invented it, um, and he lost his money. Uh, he, lo he, he made very little money from that. In later life, he became much more about beekeeping. He was big into Italian queens because he believed the Italian stocks of bees were much more suitable than the black bees that had um, been brought over originally from Northern Europe. And he died in 1895. Let's have a look at his grave. Um, the Reverend Ella Langstroth, the father of American beekeeping by his affectionate baron of fisheries who in the remembrance of his service rendered uh, Dayton, uh, Dayton, Ohio. There you go. And so very much remembered and very much, and his hive, of course, was, was, a, was a very popular hive and still is in some parts of the world. Um, of course, the hive on its own isn't enough to give us the beekeeping we have today. There are a number of really important other developments. Would you like to tell me some of those big developments that, made, that gave us beekeeping today? Queen Excluder. Queen Excluder. Anybody else? Foundation, thank you. Escapes. Escapes. Swarm control. Swarm control. Okay, any more? Honey extractor. Honey extractor, yeah. And one more, which we all use every time we go beekeeping. Smoke. 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 So, um, the three that I've listed here, and you could, the, the nice thing about beekeeping is you can argue these points. Um, one of them I've listed here, three, three I've listed here. One is comb foundation, which was invented by a guy in Germany and much improved by a guy in the States. This is Johannes Mehring, and he invented this thing here. And so you put a piece of, a flat piece of comb in, and you press down, and it gives you the hexagonal shapes which, you can, which the bees will build on in the right place. And as you can see with his design, you, you, you're getting to, um, you have to put them in each time. It's almost like a printing press, isn't it? You have to print them each time. And then Amos Root came along, and he produced this thing here um, in 1876, the mill. 
And it's like uh, my grandmother had one of these for, for the washing, you know, except this one has the, the, the hexagonal things on it and you push it through and, 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 and through comes your, your foundation and it's nicely printed. So you can put it straight in the hive. Um, the extractor, now, um, chap who invented the extractor was Major Francisco, Francisco de Hrushka. And he was, depending on your point of view, Italian or Venetian or Austrian, um, this is his original extractor. As you can see, that is uh, tangential. Um, the first one there. Um, he actually first demonstrated in the town of Brno, which is now in the Czech Republic, which I'm not sure, I think it was in the Austro-Hungarian Empire at the time. And this one, of course, is the smoker. I want to read to you, before this was invented, I want to read to you something here. Moses Quimby gets the credit for this in... Uh, in 1873, but I'll read you this from 1853, and this is from, this is Quimby. And he says, get a tube of tin about five eighths of an inch in diameter and five or six inches in long. So think a smarty tube, um, made of tin. Make stoppers of wood to each end, two and a half inches or three inches long. With your nail gimlet, make a hole through them lengthwise. So put together, it's about 10 inches long. The ends may be tapered. On one hole, leave a notch, will be held with the teeth, which is the most convenient way, as you will often want to use both hands. It's also always ready without any trouble to blow through and to keep the tobacco burning. When ready to operate, fill the, tobacco, the tube with tobacco, ignite it, and put in the stoppers. By blowing through it, you keep the tobacco burning, which while well, the smoke issues the other end. And for the non-smokers, tough, right? Um, so, you, can you, uh, no, yeah, I mean, uh, Right. Um, isn't, aren't these great, these bellows smokers? Um, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, but I, I make the point of that to show how far we've come. And we assume, we, the, we, we make assumptions about these things. But before we had these things, it must have been an absolute bugger to keep bees. It must have been really difficult. Um, so suddenly, with these things and some of the other things like the queen excluder and the escapes, um, beekeeping could be done on a large scale and get much better returns with much less waste you could actually do disease control now. You could actually find stuff and you could do swarm control. Um, and therefore, you could get much better returns. You had to spend more. Suddenly, you could produce honey more cheaply and you could produce it in large volumes. It changed the economics entirely from something that only made sense, really made sense for small beekeepers to the bigger guy who can invest in equipment and make a proper business. And the other thing is, it suddenly it makes sense for people like you to turn up to lectures, not necessarily like this one, but lectures that, there's the two sorts of bee, beekeeping lectures, right? There's the ones that make you a better beekeeper, and, and there's the ones that aren't, and this is one of the ones that aren't. So, but there's been lots of other ones like Irene's earlier, um, that make you a better beekeeper. And, and now there's value in turning up to those lectures because you could learn something which you can apply and you can make, you can make more money from or you can have less, get less stings from and just get better at beekeeping and have a better experience of beekeeping. That, that wasn't the case before. It's worth having the National Honey Show now. You know, it, it wasn't in 1850. That having been established, the movable frame came to the UK. The BBKA was informed in 1874. The BBKA exam started in 1882 with a focus on movable frame beekeeping. So there's no point doing exams in skep beekeeping, really, because good skep beekeeping and bad skep beekeeping, there's not a whole lot of difference. Do you know? I mean, it's just skep, right, you know. Yeah. Um, the British standard frame was, invented, was created in 1882, and that was a big step forward. The Honey Show dates from the 1920s, so we're nearly 100 years old here. It wasn't run by the BBK at the time. It was, it was a, more like an agricultural show. And in 1946, of course, we got the National Hive um, and the standardized WBC. So now let's have a look at the rest of the world, because other people get credit for different things. Any Poles in the audience? Anybody Polish? No. Um, one of the people who certainly had, uh, did a lot of work uh, is, um, whereas Huber discovered that queens mate on the wing, I think Huber's, Huber's servant should get all the credit, Huber's assistant should get all the credit here because he's the one with the eyes and was writing stuff down and Huber was just telling him what to say. Well, no, in fairness, you know, probably the two of them. But certainly Jan Gerzoni, uh, this guy here, he was a soldier, as you can see from his medals, and he was a priest there afterwards, and then he was a beekeeper, so he covered a lot of the bases there. He was born in Silesia, which was then in Prussia, so he was German Prussian Empire, um, and is now Poland. 
he discovered parthenogenesis. And parthenogenesis is where, uh, whereas um, male eggs and female eggs, uh, the our mammal mammalian eggs are fertilized and then become male or female, what it happens with honeybees is that an unfertilized egg becomes male and a fertilized egg becomes queen, female. And he discovered that. Probably quite a big deal for a priest to be telling people that story because, you, you know, they were... You know, you could see how that could challenge some, some views of the world. He also discovered, well, I mean, maybe not the first person or the only person, but he discovered the appropriate spacing between top bars, which apparently the Greeks had got in 18, 1682, but he got it and he wrote it down. Um, and so some people say he discovered the B space, which is plausible but not provable. Um, so certainly... He didn't create the first movable frame hive, but maybe he did the big step of identifying some parts of the B space. I don't know. Certainly, he did it on his own. Um, sorry, it is appears he did it on his own. Um, we know that Langstroth, as it happens, read this guy's book, the English version of this guy's book, in the summer of 1851, which is before he made his brilliant, had his brilliant idea. So... You know, who knows? Everybody gets, wants to get the credit, right? This guy here, uh, a Nazi dresser, Baron von Berlepsch, obviously from his name, you'll know that he was a man of, with some leisure time. He invented a front-loading, oh, sorry, a front-loading frame hive. It may be that he invented, that he, cre that he understood the B space. There isn't really any good documentation to say that he did or he didn't. Oh, sorry, to say that he did. And, you know, any Germans in the room? I suspect if you're Polish, you'll say, Giorgione's the man. And if you're German, you'll say, Giorgione. And if you're English, you'll say, Wheeler spotted it and brought it from the Greeks. And if you're Greeks, you'll say, well, we had it first. And, you know, a lot of this, you know, where you, where you stand depends on where you sit, doesn't it? Um, and so he gets a lot of credit for that. Um, Crane tries to make sense of this, and Crane gets a number of these, and she says there were a number of rational improvements to beehives from the old skep and pot beekeeping through to where we are today. And she lists them like this. I think we'll go through them. A modular hive of precision-made parts. If you're making the parts yourself, and they're more or less this big, you can make more and more of them, but you can't tell other people very easily. You want the precision-made parts, because that's how you can communicate it quickly. A framework to which the bees attach their combs. A hive with top bars. So if the bees aren't attaching their homes to a frame, well, it's really skep beekeeping or it's just wild beekeeping. It's really just bee, bee landlordism, isn't it? You, know, you just give them a box and they just take up residence. And, you know, you, it's the, there's nothing really to it. A hive with top bars at the national natural comb spacing. And a top bar extended to make a frame. And clearly, von Berlepsch had that, and Langstroth had that. And then this crucial step, frame distance from the hive walls, and implicitly from the bottom as well, and the top as well. Oh, sorry, the top is on page three, but the bottom as well. By the bee's natural space. And so different people came up with different ones of these. But then you have to pull it all together into a practical, easily workable hive with the four essential features in italics above. And so you can see having one of these and making a, often with these things, making the scientific breakthroughs all very well, but actually making the thing that people can buy and use is a very different thing. I think we should bear that in mind. Now, here's the fascinating thing. Crane has a list of um, hives, uh, innovations in beekeeping here that she says are no, a number of hives that are known to have been invented with both the top bar spacing and the bee space. But what you can see here, the date's running down from 1683. Uh, and again, there are names here I haven't mentioned, many more. And if you look at other sources, there are more names. If Dave Cushman's play, uh, website, the late, great Dave Cushman's website, has, as is now being maintained by Roger, um, has uh, a page on the history of UK beekeeping and it lists a whole bunch of people that Crane doesn't list. And I suspect, again, it's probably at a county level. If you're a Sussex beekeeper, you, you say, well, there's this fellow in Sussex. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but is it a bar or a frame? Some frame beekeeping going back to 1683. Was the spacing right? Was it OK? Yes, no, maybe. Is there frame-to-wall spacing? Uh, in many cases, unknown or just not, or not applicable. And could you put a tiered hive? Could you stack them up? Another important thing. So here's the thing, right? According to Dr. Crane, any Scots in the room, by the way? <laughs> because the one... Um, Kerr, Robert Kerr, 
Um, B. Robin, his name was, or that was his nickname, that was his kind of pen name, um, invented the Stewarton hive, which was octagonal, and it was a bar, a frame hive. Um, it had bars and frames, and, it's, and it passes Crane's test. Now, what you could do is you could write a, sli a slightly different test, and you could, you could say somebody else passed it first. There's, you know, there's a lot of... There. But Dr. Crane is a great authority. Incidentally, nearly all these innovators were men, at least the recorded ones are men, and that's, there's all sorts of socioeconomic reasons that's the case, but Dr. Crane, I think, is, uh, is, uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a woman, contributed to this discussion is, 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 is absolutely invaluable. So here's, here's Kerr's hive. As you can see, um, I, I do a little bit of carpentry, but I wouldn't fancy this. I must say, I wouldn't fancy this at all. Do you know, I mean, it, is, it does pass the test in terms of being, you know, makeable, right? but, you know, it's octagonal. And so you've got to make all those 45 degree angles. Also, it's narrow and tall, um, all the way up there and all the way down. Um, in the middle, there are frames, and at the edges, there are top bars. And it's got a little door. They liked their little doors in those days, didn't they? They all had little doors. I don't know what it is, but yeah, they all seem to say, we've got to have a door. <laughs> it's fashionable. Maybe it's just fashion. I don't know. It seems to be. Uh, but this is 1899. This is 1819. This is 30 years before uh, Langstroth. So you have the question then of why, why did it take, why did it take, um, why didn't this catch on? Why, don't, why aren't we all keeping bees in modified Stewartons uh, or modified Kerr hives? Why didn't, why didn't this happen? Why didn't some of the other in, inventions get spread and we dominate, uh, take them as well? Why did it take 30 years of ignoring this, the, the, the Kerr hive? until Langstroth came along and people go, oh, Langstroth, great, yeah, innovation. So I have a couple of suggestions here. I did some research on innovation and innovation theory. And the first one is uh, Thomas Kuhn, um, Thomas Kuhn, K-U-H-N, he wrote uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions because he, he, he remarked that very often what scientists do is when there's a new invention, a new, a new theory, like... Um, uh, you know that fire is oxidizing, you have rapid oxidization, right, of the paper or something, right? And, but it used, to be, it used to be thought it was phlogiston, this sort of stuff that was released. Um, or uh, let's say the jet engine is a great example. Frank Whittle invented it in, I think, late 20s, 29, 20, 29, 32. And he went to the RAF and went, ah, oh, don't be stupid, you know. Um, people tend to ignore innovations, particularly if they conflict with their worldview. Um, until a crisis comes. And it's not an accident that the jet engine actually got developed during World War II, because in peacetime, the cost of, oh, we haven't got budget for that jet, fancy jet engine thing, it'll never catch on, and we're fine anyway, and everybody's happy, and we've got our pet manufacturers, Hawker Sidley, whoever's building the nice airplanes that we want, and everything's in, God, this thing will, you know, and nobody understands it, so nobody wants to understand it. And, and then you've got World War II, and you're getting bombs dropped on London, you think, damn, <laughs> we, we need to solve this problem or we're going to die, you know? And suddenly the stakes are higher, and the cost, the, the cost of doing nothing becomes very high, and the cost of doing something becomes lower, and so you start to... And things like uh, Frank Whittle's jet engine or Fleming. Fleming, of course, they threw away the mould when they made him, didn't they? Oh, never mind. Um, <laughs> Fleming, Fleming, of course... Uh, discovered that penicillin would kill bacteria, you know, the, the antibiotic qualities of penicillin, and it didn't take off very well until World War II. And of course, then it becomes a very big, important thing to keep soldiers alive. Soldiers, sailors, everybody alive. Because that's how you win the war, and it becomes really important, and that's how these things change. There's lots of examples of scientific principles being ignored, even though you know, you're a voice in the wilderness saying, this is the case until something changes a crisis, and suddenly you say, damn, okay. Um, the wax moth arrived by accident in the States in the early 1800s. I'll read this to you. During the spring of the year 1806, I read an article in the Boston Patriot. This is a letter to Langstroth. And the Boston Patriot is describing the miller and the worm, and that's the, that's the moth and its larva, and their depredations, and representing them as of recent appearance in the vicinity of that city. A few months subsequently, a neighbor informed me that they were depredating essentially on his colonies. And within two years, four-fifths of all the apiaries in that vicinity were abandoned. So, obviously, without proper 
movable frame beekeeping, it's very hard to manage wax moth. And, um, and here's a wax moth. Here, here is a wax moth. Um, this is Galleria melanella, I believe. Um, and so maybe the wax moth that decimated lots of colonies made bee beekeepers think, damn, um, this isn't working. I need something else. Maybe it gave them that, that impetus to look at something else. The other idea, um, there's a chap called Everett Rogers who wrote his first book, I think, in 1953, which is the year I was born. And he's been, 1960, 1963, he's, he's been at this innovation for a long, long time, Eric Rogers. And he wrote Diffusion of Innovation. And what Rogers, Rogers says, Rogers did a lot of scientific study on innovations that actually took off. Not scientific theories now, which is what Kuhn looked at, but actually new stuff that people, that people started using, which is a slightly different question. And he said there are a number of things that have to be got right for an innovation to succeed, and succeed in terms of people adopting it. The first one is the innovation itself. It has to be significantly better than the alternatives. If it's just as good or slightly better, you probably won't get heard. Hmm? Um, the second one is easy to show people, easy to demonstrate in trial. So, you know, you imagine if you're a skept beekeeper, right, or you're keeping bees in a nut hive, and you go and see your mate Lorenzo Langstroth, and he says, tell you what, we'll go and have a look at some bees, will we? I'll take some, I'll take some bees out, and I'll show you a queen cell. And you go, geez, I've never seen a queen cell. Oh, only a dead one when I took my, you know, when the bees had died out. He said, no, I'll show you. We might see some queens emerging today. And you go along, and you show, and there's, there's a, you see a queen emerging, and it changes your life. <laughs> you know, you're absolutely sold on it, aren't you? Simple principles, and he says, it's because there's this thing called the bee space. And you go, ah, I get it. Right, okay, now I understand. That makes complete sense. Because it makes sense intuitively, you accept it. Whereas if it's a bit like, oh, there's some black box, black box, hocus pocus stuff going on. Oh, don't know how it works, but it seems to work. It's harder for you to buy. If you've got some simple thing, a simple rule, um, which politicians like, of course, give them a simple slogan to get behind. But it is also true of principles. If it's easy to buy. Now, Langstroth licensed to Otis. Otis got manufacturers to make stuff. This is at this period when precision-made furniture was starting to arrive. Factory-made furniture, rather than getting a cabinet maker to make you something, factories were banging out lots of little chairs and tables and sideboards and stuff. And so if they can bang those out, they can bang these out. They can make hives. The, the circular saw was long invented. Uh, power saws, those sorts of things were built. Um, and lots of successful reinvention. So, you know, you could take one of these, say, well, I won't bother with these little feet and the little door, and I'll make the, the walls a bit thicker, and I'll use a smaller hive, or I'll stack them. You know, you could try a little, as we, we beekeepers always do, which is why we've got the Smith and the WBC and the CDB and the yada, 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 running out of fingers. Um, a communication channel is important to get the message out there, and, of course, Wagner established the American Bee Journal. Um, the beekeeping associations were being established at that time. The media, we, we didn't have radio yet. The, the, me, the, the media was going through a change. Literacy, more people being literate. Um, and obviously better communication so you could get stuff delivered. The trains and so on spreading across the countries. Um, the benefits are quickly evident. If you keep bees for a short while with... Um, with in a movable frame hive, you'll tell the difference straight away, right? Because you can get the bees out. You have a much less worse experience of than the bees getting stuck and so on. Uh, and I think the social system is something. So social system is something that that, that, that Rogers talks about as well. Um, you have an innovative, enterprising culture in the states of we'll try new stuff. New stuff is good. The Victorian times were like that. There was loads of new things happening. Worlds, new continents being colonized and conquered and explored. Um, and people, it was a very much a can-do thing. If you go back 100 years, 200 years before that, people thought that the ancient Greeks and the Romans were the pinnacle of civilization. And if you wanted to understand what was the cleverest and the most advanced societies, go backwards and look at them. That was changing. We were now starting to look forwards, and we were producing things like ele electric stuff, electric, like electric telegraph. All these things were starting to happen. Um, and so the zeitgeist was changing inside us. Um, and of course, mass production beekeeping associations. I'll contrast this with Lister, because Lister, or Joseph Lister, he was from Essex, um, from West Ham, I think, somewhere like that, in Essex. Um, and Lister discovered antisepsis. That's to say, he discovered germ theory was just coming into its own, starting to be a thing, germs, as a, that, bug, that bad stuff is caused by germs. 
And L Lister discovered that if you get all your, when you're doing surgery, that you clean all the instruments with carbolic acid to kill all the bad stuff, and then you do the operation, the person's much less likely to get gangrene and die, right? And Lister proved this to his satisfaction and then did a number of experiments. But because it, so because it doesn't pass all these tests, it was very hard to get him to do things. You've probably heard the stories. Uh, in those days, surgeons used to wear their coats uh, covered in blood and stuff. Like, you, you know, if you want to go to get an architect, you want to make sure she or he has built lots and lots of houses and you want some evidence of that, you know? Um, um, you want a dentist who's just not just setting up their office and straight out of college. You want somebody who's actually done lots of teeth, right? And so you want a surgeon. So this is a badge of, of seniority, if you like. Um, and so the surgeons liked that idea, you know, because getting them business. And here's this up, upstart from Essex. And he was a poor communicator. Lister was, was not a clear person. His stuff was very badly written. He was, um, and so, you know, communicating your idea is really important as well. Um, and, uh, and so it took a long time. Even The Lancet wrote, a, uh, there was an article published in The Lancet, criticizing Lister's ideas as being saying they were rubbish. Of course, everybody accepts them now. But at the time, it took a long time because you had vested interests. And yet, we're, we're just slow to adopt new things. Now, having said that in beekeeping, there's so many new things that you try and you think, you know, it didn't work. You know, whenever you go to a beekeeping supplier, they'll always try and sell you something that's, that's some new thing, which, you know, has been tried before and failed, you know. Um, but uh, but this, this, is, this is, I think, what made Landstrock's thing different is that he had all of these pieces in place. So then I'd ask the question. Oh, I'll just show you this. This was invented in the 1860s, 1870s as well. It's the Thonet number nine. I think this is the number nine chair. All of you will have recognized this. It's a bar chair. It's the IKEA of its time. Th this, for me, symbolizes the progress that we made from getting a carpenter to make you chairs. This gets put together. This is an innovative technology. It's bent wood with steam. They use steam to bend the wood over time and to make that. But it can be flat. It's flat packed and they're shipped and they have six screws. One, two, three, four, five, six. And it's six pieces. And it can be flat packed and assembled by somebody with no technical skill and be mass produced. This is a society that could produce that kind of beautiful chair that lasts an awful long time and is incredibly well designed and precision made. Um, this is a society that can make beehives as well, where perhaps the society that Kerr was living in uh, the, for the Stuarton hive hadn't. So that li then that leaves us the question of what if, what if he hadn't? What if Langstroth had been, had, uh, hadn't gone to see his mate and hadn't seen the globe of bees on the guy's desk? Imagine that Langstroth had done that, but maybe he'd been walking back in 1851 and it had started to rain, or there was little kids uh, annoying him, or one of his parishioners came up to him and talked to him about his, I don't know, problems that he had, or something like that. And so uh, Langstroth didn't get the time to think and have that moment of inspiration or, you know, where he could, uh, of, of, the, of the, the sidebars and the B space at the side. What would have happened? I mean, it, it's a really important question to ponder. Oh, sorry, it's an interesting question to ponder. We, we don't, we obviously don't know, and there's a lot of, you know, what, what if history is. Very hard to, very hard to know. I think we can say, though, that because of Gergioni and Pro Prokopovich as the Ukrainian guy, um, and, um, and Kerr and all of the other people, the same, the B space, and the movable frame hive, in my humble opinion, would have been discovered, would have been commercialized by somebody else not too long afterwards. Um, it might have been, it would have been slightly different dimensions, almost certainly, because, you know, you'd have, um, as famously, Langstroth made his out of champagne crates. Um, was designed on a champagne crate because it was apparently the, a standard size for shipping box, for boxes. You could make it out of bo those boxes. Um, it would have been a different size. Um, it almost certainly would have been um, four-sided, not eight-sided, because, because the practicality of manufacturing, and because eight sides doesn't give you a significant advantage, uh, but four sides does, if you see what I mean. Um, um, so I think my own opinion is somebody, somebody would have invented it. 
Somebody would have commercialized it. We would be keeping bees in movable frame hives now. They might be called after your great-grandfather or great-grandmother um, or somebody, somebody in Ukraine or, or probably somebody in the part of the world that had the most advanced society, uh, industries, so maybe the US or the UK, um, whereas other parts of the world were lagging, or maybe China. Um, other parts of the world were lagging behind in terms of their ability to pass um, these, some, of these, some of these tests here, some of these tests here from Everett Rogers. Um, of course, some people are still keeping bees in, 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 in uh, traditional hives. These are log hives. This is, a, this is a log hive in Portugal that I saw in Portugal about 10 years ago. Um, and it's not like for show. This is just some farmer was just walking past it and I saw it. This is, uh, this is four boards. He's just got four <laughs> boards, he or she, and a bit of wire to hold them together. And uh, put them on a stand and put a, rock, uh, put a roof on a rock on top. And these are skeps, large skeps, as you can see on Lüneburg Heath in Germany. I think going for the heather. I think it was the time of, it was August. Perhaps, not, perhaps it was a bit early for that. Um, but certainly, these, yes, these are skeps on Lüneburg. You, and, and so some people persist in this kind of stuff, even though you would assume that they can afford uh, movable frame hives. Uh, maybe they just like it. I don't know. It's a good question. Um, I do like to leave you with some books. There are two books that are particularly important in this lecture. One is Dr. Crane's book, which I mentioned, The World History of Beekeeping and Honey Hunting. It's expensive. It's heavy, uh, but it's great. And the other one is Florence Nails, Florence, Lord, Florence Nails Life of Langstroth. It's out of print now, I think, but you can get, you can find it secondhand in various places. Um, and I have a cop my copy here. Um, it's a little bit of a hagiography. It's not really a critical study. It's not like my lecture in a book, in the sense it doesn't really look at the alternatives. It's about how wonderful Langstroth was. But it is a fair, it is a fair I think, um, assessment uh, of him. It, uh, sorry, it's talking all about him rather than talking about the question of how much credit does he get. So that's everything. Thank you very much. I think we have a little bit of time for questions. It's not really a question. It's more of an observation. You talk about um, not being an equivalent of the BBKA in terms of skept beekeeping. Well, actually, there is. It occurs in the 13th century with the unification of the English church because the primary keeper of bees up until the 17th century were monasteries because their course, principal yeah. Yeah. use of it was beeswaxing candles. And by the 14th century, you actually have a double height skep where you can keep your bees in one, they migrate to the second, and then you take the top off, which gives you your beeswax without killing the... Oh, yeah, I've seen hive. those, yeah. Do you have any references on that? Because uh, if you do, I'd love to, to build that into my lecture. Um, I can see if I can find them for you. I need to go through my society Brilliant. records. We'll perhaps chat later. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, uh, any... Any, anything to, because there's, there's lots you could add into this. And the, the challenge is, is, to, um, is to get it all in, to keep it into the hour or the 50 minutes of talk. We, ha we have a question down here at the front, please. You could also mention um, driving bees for, for, from skeps from one to another. We were using driving irons and beating the side. Have you, have you done that? What's that? Driving bees for, 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 from one skep to another. No, how do, we, how do we drive bees from one step to another, Chris? Well, um, you need some driving irons, which is, um, you need two, um, which are, um, um, I'll stand up. <coughs> you know, uh, driving irons, um, you need one which is like a skewer, um, which is, uh, puts um, the, 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 um, the skep, original skep with the bees and everything, honey in it, is um, inverted in, in, into a bucket. Um, have the, uh, another skep upside an empty one held on um, join the, the one end with um, uh, like a driving iron like a skewer and there are two other spacers which are um, like a double L shape um, which um, put in the other side which um, keeps the other sides open-ish yes. um, and then you sit down and, and with the um, the bucket or the lower skep between your legs, you, you beat on it with your f hands. Um, and they go up. Uh, not quite exactly the side, but slightly off, off key, about the size of a pulse rate. Uh, and, and the internal bees um, just work their way up. Yes. 
uh, and then when it's open, you put the original, the, 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 let's get there with the bees back in the original place and walk away with the empty hive with all the honey. And, you, and uh, they, will, they will leave the brood, will they? Yes. Very good. Drumming. Yeah, I, I do drumming, use yes. drumming, but I haven't used it on skeps, I must say. Yeah. No. Thank you. I'm English, but I have had connections with Polish society. Uh, I got the impression, probably by reading Karl Scholler in the past, that Jerzon would have been Langstroth if he'd, uh, if he'd written... That he, that he would have been the Langstroth... If, if he'd written in English rather than yeah, German. I think, yeah, I, communicating I thought, in a language that, that other people can... I, I thought there were clear references in his writing to B-Space, but am I wrong? Yeah, there? well, certainly, certainly he, he discovered it in terms of the, the, the spacing the top bars. Um, but, of course, Wheeler, Wheeler well, so that, that, yeah, that, he, he was one of the people who identified that, whether he was one of the first... Um, whether he generalised it from top bars to this is in general a, sp a space they won't properlize, and oh, if we only put a side on these, that, that, that's the step. I should think if you've got von Berlepsch and Gergioni, because I think they had the German language in common, in, into a room together, they could have figured it out between them, you know, and come up with Langstroth and then possibly something, or something even better, you know. Um, but they didn't, yeah, yeah, and and and, and there is, I mean, there is a strong case for, for saying these guys got there first. It's just not, I think, quite as strong. And part of the problem with me researching is I don't speak Polish and I don't speak German. I read a bit of French, but I don't speak those languages. And as a result, I can't look at Polish sources uh, or von Berlepsch's German sources, and a lot of those, a lot of the stuff isn't translated. So it is, it is always a problem where you, you know, as you say, where you stand depends on where you sit. Um, yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Gentleman here in the second row. Thank you. Lovely talk. Um, I'm just thinking about New Zealand mm -hmm. for several reasons. But, <laughs> yes, uh, indeed. Famous for beekeeping. Yes. For manuka honey. Yeah. Now, the honeybee is not, as I understand, the honeybee is not native to New Zealand. Correct. Yeah. Uh, and they were basically taken out from European pioneers, settlers on ships mm. in the period you're talking about. Yeah the early 1800s, the mid-1800s, and yeah. then later. Um, the question is, would they have been taken in skeps ah, or in uh, box hives? I did read only this week about ships, about bees being taken to Australia in, I think it was Bevan hives. And they were let fly, they were allowed to fly from the hives on the ship because, of course, the forage, the heat, the water, there's all sorts of challenges. It's incredible. Because it was sort of eight months, wasn't it, to, like, to go on a, on a ship in those days? I mean, how on earth you keep bees? You know, I, I bet you they had a, a very high attrition rate. Um, and, of course, crossing the equator and all the heat, you need a very well, very well, well ventilated. It'd be, it'd be, that would be a fascinating lecture in itself. But my understanding is at least some of them were taken in box hives. I won't go so far as to say movable frame hives, but in boxes. Um, possibly they'd be more durable as well during the voyage. You know, boxes would probably be hold together well better than skeps if there's, a, if there's storms and rain and, and God knows what else. Uh, Thank you. So one last question from Roger, um, please. Yes, yeah, Simon. Uh, yes. I don't think modern beekeepers realise um, that soon after the invention of the movable comb hive, the rapid increase in the commercial beekeepers in, in, in the United States, I mean, within a few years, yeah. there, were, there, were, there were people keeping two or 3,000 colonies that couldn't have done beforehand. Absolutely. And, um, you know, because the skep beekeeping is not worth the bother. Now, the Greeks, as we heard from Wheeler in 1682, had seemed to have cracked it, and if they had four or 500 hives, you know, assuming he did, they, they were doing top bar hives and making it work, but it didn't spread. Because, you know, people didn't, didn't copy... Or maybe they kept it to themselves and didn't tell anybody. That's another thing that you would have done. If you had a secret like that, you wouldn't have published it. Um, you know, you'd, you'd have kept it to yourself, wouldn't you? Because you, you'd have given you an advantage. But, yeah, absolutely. It changed it from something where suddenly with beekeeping you could spend capital. If you had money, you could invest money and get a big return back, which is not true of beekeeping up until that point. You know, and it, therefore it's fitted into the capitalist system that we that we that we uh, that, that was that was rampant and growing fast at the time. Yeah, right. Thank you for your questions.